Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know this is a weird time. It's a long way to go between um, venues in this massive event. Um, my name's Anthony Spiteri. I'm a global technologist at Veeam Software. And we've got David as well. Dave? Yeah, I'm a global technologist as well. So um, we both work in the same team. So we're going to talk a little bit today about how Veeam is working with AWS and how we're evolving kind of availability and not just talking about backups, but integrating with, with a lot of the cloud solutions as well. So a quick look at the agenda. So first of all, I want to ask you a question. How many people know who Veeam are? It's a strong number. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's, uh, that's good. So then um, we're going to talk about the on-premises to AWS with the uh, virtual tape libraries and AWS storage gateways. And then we're going to talk, and socks about N2WS Cloud Protection Manager. Now, it's actually called Backup and Recovery now, but I left that in there because you'll see in the demos that it's still called Backup uh, Cloud Protection Manager. So whichever name I use, it's one of the two, but that's currently where we are today. And then Anthony's going to pick it up, and I'm going to sit down because I hurt my back on Saturday putting my boat away for the winter. So um, First world problems, there, mate. No, no. <laughs> terrible, terrible life. So Anthony's going to talk about around the VMware Cloud on AWS piece, some of the cloud tiering offerings and cloud mobility as well. Dave, is it using is... VMware Cloud on AWS? Oh, yeah. Anyone using VMware Cloud on AWS today? Okay. We'll get on to that. Is your mic working by, out of interest? <laughs> you don't want him to speak. You don't want this guy to speak loud. It's yeah. dangerous. Yeah, move, move it up and it'll work better. Hello, hello. I don't think it's working. It's not on. If I look like this, does it work? No. <laughs> right. Let's work on this technical difficulty. Okay. So, a lot of people know who Veeam are, but in 2017, we did $827 million. Our goal for 2018 is to hit a billion dollars of revenue, so we're not, we're not a small company. We've got over 300,000 customers worldwide, and we protect over 17 million virtual machines, which these aren't small numbers. So when you think about kind of the scale and the competition and what's going on in the marketplace around cloud and virtualization, Veeam's been around quite a while. And one thing that we're really proud of as well is the net promoter score. So customers really like our products and that's proven through this net promoter score. And when you compare it to some other companies, it's, it's pretty high. So. As we mentioned, this kind of proven history of success. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because a lot of people know, and we kind of prepared with this being an AWS conference that a lot, a lot of people, not a lot of people, would know who Veeam is. But essentially, when you look at what Veeam's doing and where they're going, we're an industry leader. When you look at IDC, the all the tracker reports like Gartner's Magic Quadrants, all those kind of things, you can see that. Year-on-year year growth from Veeam has been quite phenomenal in what they've been doing in the data management space. And there's kind of a misconception that all Veeam does is backups, and that's not the case. When you look at what Veeam's doing now around cloud mobility, helping customers move to the cloud, come back on premises as well, there's a lot more to it than just doing backups. You can see as well, we mentioned the gut, Gartner Magic Quadrant, when you look at where we were kind of 2014, you can see we've come, come on quite a lot from a, a visionary perspective and also from a leader's perspective. This is, this is quite an achievement as well. And you think Beam was started 2007, was it? Yeah, 2006, yeah, 7, yeah. 2006, 2007. This is quite a fundamental trajectory that Beam's been on from, from a business perspective. And yeah, if we look at the why, well, my, mine's really loud actually, isn't it? So we've gone opposite. Oh, you're going to be talking to me. Like that it's, a bit, it's a bit awkward though, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> we're, English, we're English and Australian, but we're not that English and Australian. Um, all right, that's a little bit better. So three founding principles of Veeam, the why. Like, why does Veeam exist? So Veeam you know, was built for the virtual world. We're sitting here you know, 10, 12 years later at a, virtual, at a you know, virtualization type of conference. I mean, you look at AWS, a lot of what they've built on is virtualization as well, right, even though it's in the public cloud. So Veeam was built on the back of what was traditionally VMware's wave, okay, the virtualization wave that kicked in, in that's not me, in two, that works now, in 2006, 
and we've continued on that trajectory. So what we say is we were born in the virtualization world, but now we're actually growing and expanding and evolving in the cloud world. One of the big strengths of us is that we're a partner-first company. We work through a channel play. We don't have our own services. We don't offer anything as a service. Everything we do is through our channel partners and through our great network of VCSP partners as well, which is our cloud provider program. Is anyone here, I know there's one in the room, but is anyone here a Veeam cloud provider in the room, apart from the one? Okay, very good. Um, we've obviously got a strong provider there um, and a strong series of cloud providers around the world. But one of the biggest things for us as Veeam is that Veeam just works. As a technology, one of the reasons why we were able to penetrate initially um, in the early days is because you could install Veeam within seven clicks, you could back up and have your systems up and running in the backup space. So the fact that it just works is still very crucial to what we do as a company. And with that, the key platform differentiators, easy to use, building on the fact that it just works. We've got granular recovery, we've got scalable infrastructure. Some might say, you know, outside, and our competitors say that we don't scale, that's far from the truth. Being software driven means that we've got the ability to scale at your will. The reliability is important, okay? We have this portable data format, the VBK format, which is our propriety way to store backups. But that particular format is absolutely transportable, giving our customers the flexibility of choice to be able to store their data on any storage solution that they want. And we're certainly expanding that when we look at the cloud tier that we're going to talk about a little bit later into that public cloud space. And flexibility, okay, being software defined is important, okay, being able to manipulate the software, have the orchestration and automation that goes around with a software driven approach, but also hardware agnosticity. Being able to get you guys to choose what hardware you want to have your backups on and not be locked in by vendors that actually offer an all in one solution. It's a key differential. And as we're about to see, a lot of the things that David and I are going to talk about are the fact that we are now moving in that cloud-ready space as well. Yeah, so, oh, you can hear, I can hear myself now as well. Awesome. That one definitely works. So when, when we're looking at what, what Veeam's doing, and as I mentioned, Veeam just isn't a backup company. They're, they're building this hyper-availability platform, this platform that can be leveraged to manage the data, whether you're on-premises, out in the cloud, whatever platform you're running on. And when you think about what's going on um, from SaaS-based platforms, Edge and IoT, but also whether you're running on-premises in a private cloud or maybe you're using a managed cloud or, or the public cloud, Veeam has a solution that can help provide and manage all that data. And, and it's a big challenge when you think about how you're doing your backups, how you're looking after all that data. And when you think about the actual scale and growth of data compared to where we were 10 years ago, and back in the days of just single servers running in, in well, I used to keep them under my desk and I used to give them little names and polish them and they were my little babies. And then I'd have tapes and I'd take them out and I'd drive down to a safe and put them there. That's not really a solution anymore when you think about just how much data is on your iPhone. You know, the, the amount of photos that you take. And as you look at a business, this scales exponentially because it's all about the customer data. Um, you hear things about machine learning and what's going on. And, and you just look at Amazon, the scale of Amazon, the commercial business where pretty much anyone not bought something off Amazon? No, exactly. So, but they want to tailor that. Every time you open the app, it's like a treasure trove of everything I've ever dreamed of buying. You know? And that's all data that they collect and they need to manage. And it's no different with your bank now. You open your banking app and it's like the 17 different credit cards that can give you the best returns on your investment, of, which is actually what they call it, but you really you're just spending your own money. And they manage all that data. So being able to whether it's running in the cloud, whether it's running on-prem, doesn't matter whether it's on Hyper-V, vSphere, Nutanix. I have an ex-VMware background, so I still struggle to say the word Nutanix, but <laughs> it's, it's really complicated how you manage that. So Veeam's providing that all-in-one, hyper-available platform that can help you manage that data so you always know where it is in the event of a disaster so you can get your hands on it. So one of the ways that we can do this is what's called on-premises to AWS with virtual tape libraries. And essentially how it works is you have these 
on-premises AWS storage gateways. Anyone using virtual tape libraries? Yeah, okay, a few of you, great. You want to come up here and explain it? <laughs> <laughs> so essentially what, what these are is it presents itself to the Veeam backup and replication product as just a tape repository, as if it's a physical tape that you would just you that you always see in your data centers. But essentially what it's doing is it's taking that data, the Veeam backup and replication just points to the storage gateway, which then simply connects over the internet out into Amazon S3, the object storage platform. And what this allows you to do is essentially just leverage S3 as a cheap repository for all your backup data. And it's really simple to set up. You just go in and you just, once you've deployed the storage gateway, told it your S3 bucket, you just kind of go along and then you say to backup and replication, here's my tape repository, and off you go. And then the beauty of that as well is you can leverage Amazon Glacier, which is even cheaper than S3, to actually start using that to store your backups for long-term retention as well. So it's a real simple, cost-effective solution. I've got my to, to just be able to go and deploy and use Amazon S3 to store your backups. So how many people are using object storage today, just in general, not just for backups, okay? How many of you are just using, are using it for backup storage as well? Okay, a few of you, cool. So now we're gonna talk about N2WS backup and recovery. Now, N2WS was a company that Veeam acquired earlier in this year. And essentially, they provide, and the product provides, native AWS backups. So all your instances that are running in AWS, all your databases that are running there, backup and recovery, which was formerly called Cloud Protection Manager, allows you to backup all those workloads and all those instances running out in AWS. So when you look at what's kind of going on is everyone knows what AWS provides. You know, you've got like your EBS snapshots, you've got your Lambda scripting, you've got regions and availability zones, so you can architect your applications to span multiple regions, multiple countries, wherever you want to go. And Veeam and N2WS bring in a lot of capabilities that aren't currently there in the platform. So things like disaster recovery, that's a real critical one because it's not just a case of building your instances and spreading them across the world, it's how do you protect those in the event of a failure. You can do cross-account disaster recovery zones as well. So when you think about security zones in AWS and the way that a, a, an account is essentially a security boundary in AWS, using N2WS backup and recovery, you can actually replicate into different accounts and leverage those to spin up instances in the event of a failure. So has anyone ever heard of the company called Codespaces? No? Okay. So Codespaces, um, back in 2013, 2014, it's quite a good example to talk about this. Um, they essentially were like the enterprise version of GitHub. They hosted code for enterprises who could pay them a subscription free, log in, developers could collaborate and all that kind of thing. Quite a successful business. Um, it was a really good product. And back in 2014, the CEO suddenly got an email saying, if you don't pay me, I think it was something like $10 million, I'm going to delete all your data. And the CEO was like, the kind of thing I would have done. Yeah, go away, whatever, do what you want. And he's like, no, I mean it, I'm going to delete all your data. And they're sat there thinking, well, even if we've been hacked, it doesn't matter. All our instances are backed up into S3, all our databases are, are stored in S3. We have backups all around the world across all the regions. They thought their application and their solution was really safe. Now, the problem was, what they didn't know was this guy had managed to hack their root account. So everything was running under one account, and they had access, this guy literally had access to everything. So when they refused to pay, he deleted everything. So that was it, game over. So you literally like, logged onto their website a day later, and it just had one page saying, we're really sorry, we're out of business, we have no way to recover any of this, we're gonna have to pay all our subscription fees back to our customers, clearly they'll have spent some of the money as well, 
and they went just completely collapsed overnight. So that kind of shows some of the issues. And it's not just the cloud that these challenges happen. It kind of goes on as well, on-prem as well. We've seen it so many times, you know, some of the big commercial vendors, you know, get all the credit card details hacked and all that kind of thing. So having these capabilities native in AWS is really critical to running production environments in a public cloud. So how do we do it? Well, essentially, we deploy a cloud protection manager instance in AWS. Really simple. It's in the Amazon marketplace. If you search for cloud protection manager or you search for Veeam backup and recovery, you will find that there's an AMI in there that you can deploy really quickly and you can stand this up really quickly. There's like a free tier as well, so you can deploy it, test it, play with it, see, see how it works. Now that server essentially does API calls into the AWS platform. And all your different services you've got running, whether it be uh, MySQL, uh, MongoDB, you've got maybe Windows instances running there, you've got Active Directory out there, it'll just take some snapshots of them. And it'll automatically call those snapshots and store them on the EBS storage area. And what this allows you to do is then manage all those snapshots. How many people use snapshots in EC2? Okay. How many people have lost control of their snapshots in EC2 and wondered where they are and you, you've got like 50 in this region and 100 in that region and, you know, it's great. You can see them all as long as you click through every region. When you look at CPM, it manages all those snapshots for you. So you can very quickly, looking at your backup policies and everything, take full control of that data and all that disaster recovery information. We also, with the latest version, brought in S3 support. So now you can take copies of those snapshots, and I'll show you in the demo in a minute, copy them out to S3 so you have a second copy of that data. So when you think about what I was just talking about code spaces, if you've got all these snapshots and they're all in one account and then something happens, you're kind of in a similar situation. Well, with CPM, you can actually copy those out to S3. You can copy them out to a different account as well. So it's not just the same account with S3. You can set up permissions and access and all that kind of thing. And then, so you have multiple copies of your data. And then with the integration of the solution that, that Veeam has called Veeam Availability for AWS, Leveraging Veeam backup and replication and also backup the N2WS backup and recovery, you can then even copy these back to on-premises and have multiple copies. You can restore the instances out to your on-prem environment. So if you've got vSphere, for example, you can actually restore these directly, pull the, the, the copies down from S3, restore them onto to vSphere, Nutanix, whatever you've got. So it gives you a lot of granular control, but also a lot of control over the mobility and the migration of these backups and these, these workloads as well. So when you look at it from a quite a high level perspective, essentially what we're doing is Cloud Protection Manager takes copies of all these instances in EC2. We leverage the snapshots in EBS as short-term backups. You know, if you're going to have thousands and thousands of snapshots that are maybe hundreds and hundreds of gigs getting into terabytes, it's going to get quite expensive. So then you want to start looking at doing archiving and long-term repositories out into S3 as well. So you can leverage that. And then with Veeam backup and replication, it's really easy to bring them back on-prem, move them around, restore out to AWS, back to AWS, do whatever you want with them. And you'll see in a minute in the demo. So it kind of gives you a lot of control around that. And I'm, I'm going to open it up for 30 seconds. Do we have any questions so far on that? Yeah? Uh, no, not today. So coming soon, some point, yes. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned about EC2. How about database uh, corporate? Does it do backup to RDS uh, and EC2 and also database? Yeah, so it does. You can back up all the databases. 
Um, with the current version, you can archive them off to S3, but you can back up all those database services. When we look at, um, if we go back. Or are, are you talking about inside the EC2 instance? No. Or separate? Yeah, so services, yeah. We, we support um, like MongoDB, uh, Cassandra, MySQL, Amazon DynamoDB, all those kind of ones. And it'll take all the snapshots and s store them all in the EBS snapshots as well. So now we'll go to the demo. Sorry, Sorry I had the lady flicking around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Open the can. So if it's running in an EC2 instance, you're going to back up that instance and take a snapshot of that instance. If you're running them natively in the Amazon services, then you're going to take snapshots of them services. So they're two fundamental different things. So if, you're, if you've got a database, it's not agent-based. So there's not an agent in there that's just going to back up the database. If it's running in an instance, you're going to actually just take a snapshot of that whole instance. Okay? Yeah. I'll continue. Keep some more till the end, and then... Um, you, you might win a pair of socks. <laughs> so this is Anthony's laptop, so if it all goes wrong, I'll defer to him. Yep. But essentially, when we, we log in, we can see that we've got Cloud Protection Manager, which is now called Backup and Recovery. And you can see straight away that we have the backup monitor here. So this is where we're monitoring all our backups. We can see the status of them, what's been running, um, what's been going on with S3, has everything been copying off correctly? We can very easily set up policies as well, so we can define what our backup targets are, where we're going to copy them to, how we're going to manage them, do we want to do disaster recovery and replicate these to different regions, and we can also run our policy straight away. So what I'm going to do here is go straight to our S3 repositories, and I'm going to create a new S3 repository, and essentially what I'm doing here is telling backup and recovery, cloud protection manager, that I want to essentially allocate an S3 bucket as a repository to this. Now, you have to have the bucket created. So, and I'll show you in a sec that we don't actually, I haven't actually created the bucket straight away. So what I'm doing here is configuring the regions I want to do, and I'm going to give it a bucket name. And then as I'm doing it, I suddenly remember, oh, I haven't created my bucket. So I'll go over to the S3 management console, and I'll create a bucket purely for this. So as we're creating this bucket, we can also see my ability to not understand uppercase. So I now go back and realize I should have read it sooner. And, and then we'll pick our region. So we'll say Ohio. We'll say next. And I'm not going to put on any versioning or anything like that. I'm just going to create a standard bucket in S3. And I'm going to create the bucket. Now we can see here that it's just a standard S3 bucket. So now I'm going to go over back to Cloud Protection Manager, pick up the, put in the demo, na uh, the bucket name. And then I also have the ability to enable encryption. Now this isn't encryption at the S3 layer. This is actually encrypting the snapshots being copied over. So we can give it a password, and essentially they're encrypted as they're being copied over to S3. So it's really easy. We just say, give it the, the, the bucket name. And we can see here that we've got the S3 demo configured, what the AWS bucket name is. And now we're going to create a policy and assign some backup targets. So we'll give it a name, a demo, and my typing is atrocious. I can't even see your fingers moving. Oh, no. I'm, I'm amazing. So, and then we have the ability as well to pick how many generations we want to save. So how, how, essentially, how many of these backups do we want to keep locally um, in EBS? So now we're going to click on backup targets. We're going to pick a, a, a particular VM, an instance. So we'll say dem demo Linux. And we'll just add that as a backup target and into this policy. Now what we need to do is tell it that we want to copy this as well to S3, so we'll enable that. How many copies do we want to keep? What buckets do we want to use? And then we'll simply say, right, run this, this particular policy. So it started. 
and the gods will come along and we'll see that what's going on here is it's in progress and as if by magic it finishes really quickly and now we're doing now the backups completed so we can see here that that backup was successful it took a snapshot of that instance it stored that instance on the EBS storage environment and now we're doing a copy to the S3 bucket so we can go into the S3 bucket itself and we can actually see what's happening here and if we look then we can see a lot of kind of UUIDs around this and then we see a lot of the block stores and the metadata that is kind of proprietary to this platform that we use to back up all our data so these are called like OVBKs and this is what we use in Veeam so essentially what we've done there is very quickly we've created an S3 repository we've connected to it from Cloud Protection Manager we've backed up an instance and we've copied that snapshot out to the S3 repository now what we're doing is we've gone to our on-prem environment and using external repository which is part of the solution of Veeam availability for AWS we're actually going to pull a copy of that backup from the S3 bucket and store it locally so we configure our external repositories we just simply add it and we'll give it a name so we'll change it to external repository we have already assigned some AWS credentials and then we pick what data center regions we want what region is the S3 bucket in and then we can actually see the list of all our buckets and then all we're doing now is just picking the folder that we've created in that bucket and we're applying that so we've essentially told backup and replication on premises that we have an S3 bucket as an external repository that we can use to pull all our backups from AWS into our on-premises environment so now what I'm going to do is go in there and look at the backups that we've actually got so by going in here we can see that we have that N2WS backup we can restore back to EC2 if we want to we can delete it we can check the properties of it and we can also restore it locally so we can restore it as a Linux VM on vSphere or whatever now by going into the backup copy jobs we can actually pull this down and store it locally on that backup and replication server if only I could type quicker so now we just simply say right here we are here's the, the backup job and we just add it and what this does is really quickly it just pulls it down from that S3 repository stores it directly and what we'll do is we'll look at that as it configures it now we can look at the statistics and then we'll get like the information of how quickly we're pulling it down so we'll see the throughput how quickly it's going we're seeing that we're actually pulling this down locally and Anthony's going to talk a little bit in his section about the actual like 321 rule of keeping multiple copies in different locations and the benefits of that so really quickly to finish off we look we see that we've now got a copy of that backup in our on-prem environment that we can go do whatever we want with it and we'll switch back if we can switch off the demo please switch back to there we All go right, there perfect we go. okay so funny story as well David talked about that company that got done um, you know on the um, on AWS so I actually got done a couple of months ago myself for my own account I stupidly went into github and published a project and I realized that I published my AWS access key up at the same time it was no longer than two minutes up there but within that two minutes there was an automated user that was scraping the github pages within two minutes all of my stuff that I had all around the world was deleted and they span up 240 servers in each region had a bill of seven thousand dollars within a couple of hours so it can happen 
AWS are really good and gave me the, the, the credit, but you know, just an example of how easy it can happen today. Automation is so powerful, but it's also so dangerous if that key gets you know, in the wrong hands. So just another example of why you do need backups in the cloud. So with that, I'm going to quickly talk about VM Cloud and AWS. And obviously today there were some really interesting, um, I guess, what you would call major announcements about how this is going to be taken into the outpost, okay, into the edge. But obviously what we've talked about traditionally with VMware Cloud and AWS is the fact that we're extending your VMware on-premises location onto a SDDC or a software-defined data center that's sitting on AWS global infrastructure. And the big part about that, obviously, you guys would know if you see the, the keynote, is that basically you leverage native AWS services within that service, okay? Now, it's still very important to understand that you need backup for this particular service. And with the solutions that David's talking about with native EC2 backup with N2WS, and also our traditional backup and replication services, we've now got this portfolio of backup options to basically back this up end to end. And when Outpost gets released next year, we'll also be well positioned to basically back up anything that is sitting on that Outpost as well. And why we're positioned well to back up VMware Cloud and AWS is the fact that there's a sense of familiarity. The same backup and replication console that you guys would use, and again, a lot of you guys are customers, so you know the console very well, it's that very same console. There's flexibility in the fact that we can do backup and replication at a very good price point for those workloads that are running on VMware Cloud and AWS. It's a trusted platform. We've talked about the history. We've talked about the fact that Veeam is 11 years old, you know, shipping code, shipping backup and replication for 10 of those years. A very trusted relationship with VMware and Veeam to make sure that you're backing up those native um, VMware workloads with absolute certainty. And then the fact, again, like we've talked about, it just works, okay? The fact that all you need is backup and replication, update 3A, and any version of the VMware cloud that's running at this point in time will be compatible to be backed up, okay? Update 4 will have more features built in, but we'll get to that a little bit later on. David talked about the 3 2, 1 rule of backup, and, you know, why are we talking about backing up a solution that's on the cloud? Isn't the cloud always available, okay? We'll get into that a little bit later, but the 3 2, 1 rule of backup talks about three copies of your data on two different media, but more importantly, one that's off-site, and that's the critical one to remember in this scenario, because you still need availability. The cloud is not this panacea of a solution, okay? And whether we like to admit it or not, there can be issues. And if you have a look at the diagrams here, what we've got is a certain you know, type. There's three different scenarios. There's the failure of one particular workload. Okay, this can happen by just a VM blue screening okay, at the guest level. Um, you can have some corruption of data. You can have data fat fingered. You can have malicious intent. Okay, individual workload failure is probably more common than a bomb dropping or something else going really wrong in that data center. Now, obviously, AWS designs with availability in mind, and they have got availability zones. And they build availability zones just in case one of those zones goes down, okay? So obviously, that's something that can happen. And what does happen occasionally, but not you know, as often, um, is that a whole region can suffer some sort of issue. So the key there is that you have to design and you have to um, be ready to deal with any one of these particular scenarios. And the fact that we have a product that can be installed from the marketplace. So VMware has launched what they call the VMware Cloud Marketplace, not the AWS Marketplace. This is if you log on to cloud.vmware.com. You now log in there where you can actually set up your uh, VMC setup. They have a marketplace. From the marketplace, you can deploy VM backup and replication with a couple of clicks, okay? Ready to go, all automated. Again, I talked about the power of being software defined, this is where it comes into play, okay? And while we're a very strong choice for backing up VMC workloads. As we go through this, we're using a few cloud formation templates. What we're doing is we're deploying the Veeam server into the SDDC vCenter. And what we're doing is we're configuring an EC2 instance that's gonna be used as the external repository in the VPC that you've set the SDDC into. Lots of uh, acronyms there, they all work well. Um, the key part here is that we actually set up that repo as well. So when you go to log in once this process is finished, 
basically then you've got a working backup replication server ready to go. Okay, so that's from the VMware Cloud Marketplace. What we also have and what I've been working on over the past six or so months is an automation script that's on GitHub and if you guys take a photo of that um, QR code you'll get to the page. Basically this is a fully deployable toolkit based on PowerShell, using Terraform, using Chef to basically deploy backup replication primarily onto VMware Cloud and AWS but actually can be used to deploy onto any VMware based virtualization platform. Okay, so something that's really interesting, and again, we wanted to do this to basically show the power of the software driven approach that we have, but also to make it really easy for our customers to be able to go and deploy Veeam and have it ready to go. Okay, so we're not going to dive too deep into that, but if you guys go to that particular GitHub page there, you'll see exactly how that works and how you can pull it down and start to leverage it and basically use the code yourself to deploy Veeam in a really easy way. What it actually ends up looking like is what you see on the right hand side. A fully deployed Veeam backup replication instance, a VPC that sits with a repository that's on Linux, okay, and also connectivity through to Cloud Connect providers. So for those that don't know, Cloud Connect is something that our Veeam Cloud providers run as an off-site repository. That's that one that I was talking about, that one off-site copy of your data, okay. Understanding that if you put it locally, there's still the issue of what happens if you lose that particular SDDC. So that's why we're saying the options are there for you to pull the data and either make that data go to a Cloud Connect provider, either take it and shift it on premises, because obviously through network connectivity, if you're running a data store, if you're running Veeam on premises as well, you can pull that data off. Or the other way is to basically take it out and put it into that EC2 instance that we've had provisioned. Okay? Now if you see here, the actual data flow is going out of the network and going back in to the EC2 instance. The better way to do it is to basically use the electric, uh, say the Elastic network interfaces that AWS provides to basically get the data through straight from the VPC into the SDDC, okay? No egress charges if that happens, right? And what I'm gonna talk about next and show is another step to that process, which now uses our new cloud tier to basically take the data that's sitting on that repository and shift it into cheaper storage, which is object storage, which in this case is obviously going to be Amazon S3. Okay, so we're going to deep dive into that particular scenario right now. Part of update four, so just by show of hands, in the crowd, who's running the latest version of backup replication in terms of 9.3, sorry, 9.5 update 3A? Okay, so update four is coming. We've been talking about it for most of the year. It's going to be coming in probably a couple of weeks for our providers, and it's going to be announced and released in GA in January at our partner conference. But one of the two key features that we're releasing is about around Amazon features, so the cloud tier and cloud mobility. So we actually announced this last year, and we announced it under a different name. For those that have been paying attention, we called it the archive tier. But what we've done is we've actually re-engineered it over the past 18 months to make it a lot more smarter. Okay, so now it's effectively the cloud tier. And the basic premise of this solution is that we're taking data that has traditionally sat on more expensive local storage, okay, and it's also addressing the actual reality that data is growing. We all understand that the amount of backup data that we're actually, you know, storing is exponentially growing versus what it was even five or so years ago. And that data is still relatively expensive, even though the cost of that storage is cheaper we're storing more of it. So the fundamental idea of this particular feature is to take that data and shift it to somewhere that's cheaper, okay? And in this case, the best use case of that is object storage. And in this specific example, it's gonna be using Amazon S3. And how we do it is actually quite smart now. So for those that know about a VBK file, I talked about it earlier, okay? In the VBK file, we have metadata and we've got the data. So we know exactly what data sits where and what machines it actually belongs to. So what we do is that we take the data blocks and we strip them out of the VBK. So those VBK, those data blocks, they're moved into the bucket and what we're left with is a dehydrated VBK file. Okay? And what that means is that a, a VBK file that was sitting there in your repository that might have been a terabyte is now only about 22 megs in size. Okay, 
but it remains on that local repository. And one of the things I actually forgot to talk about in the previous slide was the fact that this is actually a feature of our scale-out backup repository. So the Sober is effectively a way to use different types of repositories, put them together in a top-level namespace, and have a distributed repository across multiple storage types. What this capacity tier is, as it's named in the console, is basically an extra extent in that scale backup repository, which then is programmed to basically say to move data into a Amazon S3 bucket. And what are the benefits of this? So obviously what it does, it basically adds a level of flexibility and I guess scale to this scale up backup repository, or else before you were very much restricted in terms of the size of that, depending on what you had locally. Now if you're using Amazon S3, it's effectively infinite in scale, okay? Because obviously Amazon are not gonna run out of any data anytime soon, in theory, okay? There is a way that you can actually make this S3 compatible as well. So if you guys that are running on-premises S3 as well, is there anyone who's running on-premises S3 object storage compatible? Anyone at all? Okay. Those people that have put their hands up before using object storage, are they are you using S3 predominantly as your object storage type? Can you just put your hands up if you're using S3? Okay. So that's going to be great. So this is going to be an extension of that. The key part about it here is that we don't charge a subscription fee for the data that's sitting in your object storage. A lot of our competitors are basically double dipping in terms of charging a per gigabyte fee for data that sits in that object storage. But for us, it's basically just a feature of the addition that you need. And the addition that you need for this feature is Enterprise or Enterprise Plus. So the key characteristics, like I've talked about, are the fact that we take the data, we offload it to object storage. We have those shells that sit locally and that stripped out dehydrated VBK file. Now the really cool thing and the really thing that we're proud of in terms of the innovative feature here is that all the functionality that you guys know that you can do, right click on the VBK file in the console, you can do with this dehydrated VBK. Okay, so that means if you see the machine sitting in the Veeam backup replication console, though data is sitting partly locally and partly in the object storage, you're going to be able to do things like instant VM recovery, you're going to do things like uh, file level recovery, obviously restore to um, a Hyper-V, to VMware, um, to AHV coming shortly, and also obviously to EC2, which we're going to show as part of the cloud mobility. And what we've also done to make things a little bit smarter is we've gone ahead and we've done what we've called intelligent block recovery. Because putting things into EC2, or sorry, putting things in S3 is relatively cheap. Pulling it out is where you're going to start to incur data charges, egress charges. So what we've done is we've basically had some technology, some smarts in there, which looks at the backup files of the blocks that are sitting locally. And what's going to happen is if the blocks are local, we're not going to pull the same blocks that are sitting on the actual object storage itself. So it's obviously going to mean a quicker restoration, but also a cheaper restoration at the same time. In terms of how this works, in terms of, you know, what are the characteristics which make data be sent into the object storage, there's two basic conditions that need to be met. The first one is that it needs to be within operational restore window. That's a policy that you set. Anything older than X amount of days, send up to the object storage. That's the first. But the second one, and more importantly, is the sealed backup chain, okay? Now, for those that don't know what the sealed backup chain is, I'm just going to run through a couple of examples of that. And they'll make sense for you guys that have used Veeam and understand um, forever forward incrementals, reverse incrementals, um, full um, backups, active and synthetic fulls, okay? So basically, if you have a forward incremental, and this is kind of the diagrams on our website, what we're going to show here is what is capable of being moved into the object storage, what constitutes a sealed backup chain. In the case of a forward incremental, it'll basically be all those vib files plus the VBK file once you do an active full, okay, or a synthetic full. Now, the key part about this, for those that might be running forever forward incrementals, is there anyone running forever forward incrementals out of interest without any active fulls? Yeah, you got one. Up. You got one over there? So those will not be capable of going up to the archive. Okay, so very important to understand that. But obviously we put in the facility for you to just click the button and create an active full, and they'll be up there. For reverse incrementals, basically we'll be taking the VRB files that live 
on the left side of those last two. Now, the reason why those last two files are not included is basically because the way that the reverse incremental works, those last two files are always being transformed and changed, okay? Therefore, they're not sealed. They're still changing. So that's basically what will be there. In, the terms, in, the term, in terms of um, GFS, so backup copy jobs, it's basically very simple. It's those files that have been grandfathered, so those full VBK files that live there. And for those that are pumping up their data and for cloud providers as well, this is going to be a massive feature because Cloud Connect, the majority of those jobs being sent up are these backup copy jobs. So it's going to actually really increase our cloud providers' um, efficiencies and how they're storing their data. We've also got forward and rollbacks at the same time. In terms of a few blocks, like getting into a little bit of a deeper dive here. So in terms of the dehydration process, what we do, if they're in that operational window, we take the blocks that live within the VBK. Now remember, we're not actually moving those VBK files. And what we're doing is we're shifting everything across with the blocks. As they move across, the blocks move across as well. So now those blocks live on the object storage in Amazon S3. What's happening, though, is that we're also indexing these files. So effectively, what we're achieving here is source-side dedupe, okay? Again, being smart. And what that means is you're actually going to have the ability to reduce the amount of data because if we see a match block, we're not going to move it up twice, okay? Really good from the point of view if you've got servers, multiple Windows servers, multiple Linux servers, that might be the same. The typical example there is the operating system partition. They're all the same blocks. We will understand what's the same. And because of the indexing that we're using, we're not going to shift those blocks up. Very smart way of doing it. It's what makes this a little bit more different in terms of what our competitors are doing. In terms of rehydration, it's basically in, in the opposite direction, where we look at a particular block and we move it back based on what we need. And I'll show you that a little bit later on. This actually explains that a little bit better. So if we look at the way that we, re we rehydrate the data, on the right-hand side, you've got the file, which is the metadata, which tells us where the blocks are. On the left-hand side, you've got a full backup and full backup too. What we're doing is we're rec recovering basically the files that are in full backup too. As you can see, we need blocks A, B, and D. If you look at the metadata that's sitting in object storage, we have blocks A and B. But D isn't there, okay? So what we're going to be doing is pulling that block from the local repository to complete the set. And when we're doing the restore of a file, a similar theory applies. Again, increasing efficiency of that re restoration, but also reducing the costs of the egress traffic that you're going to incur, okay? So some very smart stuff there. In terms of sizing and costings, basically, if I blow this out, for those that know about our basic features and how we actually configure our backup jobs, we've got four levels of, um, I guess, compression. And if you look at the block sizes, we've got a local target, which is one meg. When compression comes in, it's going to be half a meg. Most people use this particular setting because it's a default setting in Veeam. Others are used depending if you choose a LAN target, a WAN target, or if you've got a big local storage that you want to big, uh, copy big blocks across. So what we're actually going to do, if we look at a local target, we're going to look at 1,024 bits. That's the size of the block that we're going to be shifting up. Obviously, there's going to be compression in there. So what we've found with this particular size, the average block size will be 512. Okay, K. Okay. Again, important to understand in terms of costings, because every type of shift that we put up there, there's an associated S3 cost for puts and gets. The smaller the block size means that we obviously push and we do more of those operations, so it's going to cost you a little bit more. But for those that understand the costings of S3, we're talking about 0.01 of a cent per those operations. So we're talking about dollars per month. Again, I've talked about the fact that because it is job-based, we're doing source-side deduplication. We've got the intelligent block recovery. So again, just put in some smarts into this product. For sizing, we've modeled this around what uh, is Microsoft's ReFS file system. So in terms of sizing at the moment, you can use the ReFS sizing tool calculator to go and actually do the calculations as we move forward. And let's just shift and do a quick demo because I want to show you some of the capability before we finish off. So if we can 
change the screen over. Okay. So, what I've got here is I've obviously got a live server. Um, I prefer to do live demos rather than David, who wants to just be sure, but, you know, I like living on the edge. So, basically, what we've got here is a backup infrastructure. You can see here that we have, if I click through there, we've got the Scala Backup Repository. The Scala Backup Repository, again, that top-level namespace. As we click into it, you can see that we've actually got a server that's using two normal repositories, and it's also using this capacity tier here. And this capacity tier has been previously configured with a similar way that you saw David configuring the external repository. The policies are set by basically going into that, clicking on properties, the performance tier is selected, this is where you can put multiple local repositories, but the key part here for the cloud tier is selecting this capacity tier option here. Move older backup files based on X amount of days. In my example here, I'm using one day because obviously I want to get files in there for the purpose of the demo. Typically, this defaults to 30 days, but it's completely controllable by you guys. We've also got override features, which basically let you guys do some, I guess, uh, storage uh, calculations based on, you know, if you're going to fill up a repository, previously there was no way to control that. With this actual override in place, you can start to shift data if you reach X amount of consume space on that actual repository. So if I cancel that, what you can see here at the moment is we've got 38 gigs of data sitting in that actual capacity tier. So what I'm going to do, I've configured a couple of jobs here. And as you can see here, we've got a job of type disk. And if I right click on the properties, you'll see here that we've got a couple of VMs that are living in that job description. Now what you can see though is that we've got a little icon here that sits and the icon here means a couple of different things. This one is local. If I click down, you can see we've changed to a cloud icon. That means that the data is sitting in that VBK file but the blocks are in the object storage. And what we can actually do here is we actually force a rehydration as well if we want. So we can actually pull this data down locally if we want for whatever reason. We've got control through this actual process here. If I click on that, what I want to do is I want to show you some of the cool things about it and why our technology, I think, is way ahead of the competition. What I'm going to do here is do an instant VM recovery. So instant VM recovery is obviously our patented technology, um, which instantly recovers a VM using an underlying NFS share onto the hypervisor. Okay? But what I'm going to do, you can see here the location. So we've got the initial backup sets that are in that operational window that live on the actual Scala backup repository. And we've got these ones here, which live on the actual object storage. So what I'm going to do here is basically use that one, and I'm going to do a live mount of that machine. So let's go through this process. We want to store the tags. Let's give it a different name. OK. Click Next. Story is actually what I'll do. I forgot to turn it on. See, this is why I do recorded ones, because then you never need to go back. Yeah, really. There you go. <laughs> so what I'll do is I finish that. So now it's going to go in the background, and what it'll do is it's going to kick off that job. And that job is going to go and actually mount that NFS share, read the data that's sitting in that repository. But again, some of the data is going to be local, but the majority of it's going to be on the object storage. So if we go and have a look, just to make sure there's no smoke and mirrors, once it actually does the recovery, what we'll see is that we'll start to see some traffic going to S3. But before I do that, let's go and see that it is actually doing its thing. Let's log in. Okay, there it is. So that's the machine there. So you can see here that we're running actually in. Let's turn it on. Are we on? Power it on. Okay. So now we've powered it on, but we've got data living in both ends. And what we should see, like you can see there, is basically data streaming from S3. How cool is that? Okay. So that VM is now running, but part of it is running out in that object storage. That's pretty cool. And now what you have is the ability from here 
to basically do a storage VM motion. So this VM will come up. Yes, it'll come up and run fairly slow because obviously we've got data coming across the internet, but you've got your data up and running. And from this point, you, all you do is a storage VM motion to bring the data back into the local object, sorry, into the local data store. Pretty cool demo working well. And just to make sure that there is no smoke and mirrors, because what we like to do, you can see here if I open the web console, we should be loading up Windows. So that's a pretty cool demo. All right, if we just switch back. So very quickly, I want to talk about Veeam Cloud Mobility for AWS. So this is obviously working on the premise that once we get data into that VBK file, if it's been backed up using Veeam Backup Replication, if it's been using our agent technology, whichever way, if we're using it via what David talked about, the N2WS external repository, once we get it into that repository, it's very mobile. And in this case, part of update four is basically being able to take that data and construct Amazon EC2 instances from that data and from the, that data that sits within that VM. And we'll go through a very quick demo because time is actually running out. But what I'll do is I just want to show you that interface. So can we switch back to the demo screen, please? Okay. So what we'll do is we'll pick on some other machine that was in that job. And what we can actually do here is we can now, which is that one, where are we, disk. We've got the ability to restore to Amazon EC2. So again, using the same account we've plugged in, we've got the ability to basically pick the region and click the data center. So let's go and put it in Ohio. It's one of our favorite ones. Basically, give it a name, pick the instance type. That's what we'll do here. It'll have a list of all the instances that are listed and available within that particular region. And it'll give you actually a costing as well, which is pretty cool. So to show you exactly how much it's gonna cost you per month, if you were to run it as part of that instance, we'll click on next, we'll select the network. And basically, obviously, you need to have a VPC pre-provisioned within that region, otherwise you're gonna not have any network information pop up. And then from there, usually what we'd do is we'd basically go next, next, and it would go out and restore that into EC2 directly, okay? So again, a really cool feature, something that we've expanded from our previous technology which went into Azure, we can now take this and move into EC2. So again, a really good use case from a point of view of taking that machine and shifting it maybe from the point of view of a recovery purpose, but you know, test or dev, there's many use cases for this particular feature itself. So that was a very quick demo of that mobility feature. Can we just switch back, please? Uh, it, invalid will get back up. Oh, there we go. I apologize, thank you for bearing with me. So really quickly, because Anthony's left me one minute and 54 seconds, um, we just want to kind of wrap up and, and understand what, what Veeam's doing and where Veeam's going as well, just from a, a product perspective and also from a cloud perspective. So we've given you a very quick kind of overview of what we can do with cloud backups and disaster recovery, how we can also protect infrastructure as a service, but also software as a service as well. When you think about like email solutions that are, that are running as SaaS based products out in the public clouds. And then also actual cloud data protection. So in the past, it's all been about how you can just back up on prem and copy it out to the cloud. Now what we've shown you today is how you can actually protect all those workloads that you have running out in your Amazon public cloud environments. And when you look at kind of what we're doing, when we talk about that whole data management platform that I mentioned right at the beginning of the session, when you look at this slide, you can see kind of the scale and the complexity of managing that data across all these platforms. So we not only have AWS, but we have things like Office 365, which everyone uses. We've got VMware Hyper-V. You've got VMware Cloud on AWS. You heard about the, the Outpost solutions today from AWS, you know, what's gonna go on there. And then even things like AIX, you know, everyone thought AIX was dead, and then you go talk to a bank. And Veeam's able to support all these platforms and across all these different regions, essentially around the world, and manage them for you. So I have 15 seconds left, because they are pretty strict here. And the guy who last asked me a question has gone, so I'm going to throw the socks. And it's like a stadium. Whoever catches them wins. And it was the most <laughs> pathetic throw. Of... 
Oh you, to be fair, you should have threw them because you play cricket. I play so cricket, yeah. I'm crazy. a soccer player. That's why I'm a He has a bat. bat. Yeah. <laughs> so, but thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, please, come, please come find us outside. Cheers.